Um, he has, his uh, expertise uh, spans uh, many areas related to uh, uh, Sephardic and Syrian culture, history, halakha. Um, he gives talks, you know, short talks very often for the, uh, the SCA, the Sephardic Community Alliance, which I've enjoyed from time to time. Um, he has an affinity for collecting rare and important chuvot and, and sidurim. Um, he's very devoted to preserving uh, Sephardic culture and he's compiled and edited uh, many books for the community and given uh, lectures on a wide variety of topics. He's also an expert on Sephardic chazanut um, and is a co-founder of a forum dedicated to preserving Levantine and the Egyptian chazanut. Um, he's often consulted and interviewed by researchers and historians uh, for his valuable input and insight. Um, as I said, I've, I've heard a few of his uh, talks through the SEA. They're always uh, very informative going back to um, what was done in, in Syria. Um, and he really is very dedicated uh, to preserving um, kind of the, the customs uh, from Syria. And I think uh, maybe not most importantly, but he is actually not the first pharmacist to give us a talk on Jewish history. <laughs> um, we'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, Lauren and, and Chaim Grunsfeld and Jacqueline and Itai Lahav. Uh, without further ado, Mr. Mosseri. Thank you very much for having me. I'd like to thank first and foremost to Rabbi Eitan Tokayer, somebody who I've known for quite a number of years, fantastic individual. He reached out to me. I was excited to do this. We had a couple of uh, pitches and delays, but uh, here we are. So I'd like to thank once again Rabbi Tokayer, the Kingsway Jewish Center, the sponsors, Lauren and Chaim Grunsfeld, of course, uh, Jacqueline and Itai Lahav, and everyone that's here with us tonight. Um, as far as the intro that Itai gave, that's a little bit too much. I'm just a fan of my heritage. So just being a fan of my heritage, I've always delved into it, studied it, and Tonight's talk about the Sephardic approach to Zionism and the Sephardic place in the history of the state of Israel is just part of that. And I think I'm only going to be scratching the surface because there's so much to say. Before I begin, I must mention Professor Rabbi Jose Faur, who passed away last week. He was somebody that was very instrumental in opening my eyes on this particular subject about the Sephardic uh, place in Zionism. It, he taught me about it in person back when I was just a high school student. I was friendly with his son, A.B., who's a rabbi now in Manhattan Beach. And he really opened my eyes to this. I would also like to thank a good friend of mine, Murray Mizrahi, who in his research for his doctorate also uh, studied this area and wrote in this field extensively. So a lot of what I'll be saying tonight comes from both the late Rabbi Faur and my friend, Mary Mizrahi, Dr. Mary Mizrahi. So I'd like to start with a quote from the journalist and author, Mati Friedman. Mati Friedman, in an article in the New York Times, March 1st, 2019, wrote, Israel tends to tell a European story about itself. Theodore Herzl, socialism, the Holocaust, and many Israelis and many of our enemies like to imagine that this country doesn't quite belong where it exists. But even if we set aside the one fifth of Israel's citizens who are Arab Muslims, half of the Jewish population here in Israel has roots in the Islamic world. That being said, we now know that over half of the Jewish population of the state of Israel is Sephardic, and not just Sephardic, but Sephardic from the neighboring Muslim countries. That being said, is it possible, can it be that none of these Sephardic Jews or Jews of Arab lands had a hand in developing the state of Israel in being part of those early aliyot in developing the country, in the finance, in the architecture, in the agriculture, it can't be. And that's where I'm gonna start with. So it's generally thought of once again that the Halutzim, the pioneers that arrived with the first Aliyah, 
1903, and the second Aliyah, 1904 to 1918. They're the ones who did everything. They came in from Russia for the most part, and they single-handedly built the country. And Shafar Adim didn't show up until post-1948. Now, obviously, this, as far as I'm concerned, this is a myth. It's just not true. It can't be true. Yes, we cannot take away the great work that these early Halutzim did. Their pioneer work was incredible. Their dedication to the land, unsurmountable. But it doesn't justify erasing the roles of the Sefaradim who were already in Eretz Israel and made Aliyah all along and together with the early mass waves. They have, there were early Aliyot among Sefaradim in the 1860s. Hundreds of families from Morocco made Aliyah. 1870s to 1880s, you had Jews from the Balkans, from Yemen, from Bukhara. 1900 to 1920, you had Jews from Syria. From 1920 to 1930, you had Jews from the Turkish Empire, you had from Egypt, you had from Iraq, you had from Iran, you had from Kurdistan. From 1930 to 1940, you had Moroccans and Greeks. And then again, post-48 until at least 1960 and even after, you had from the entire Sephardic world. So there were waves of Sephardic Aliyot coming in and not just parts of the first Aliyah and second Aliyah. We had predating the first, and all the way after the second and the third Aliyot even. And that's what I'll take it from today. Where did this surge and urge and love of the land of Israel come from among the Sephardim? And how did the leaders among the Sephardic communities get their message across to their people to make Aliyah and to be involved with Eretz Israel? What was their connection over here? So obviously we know that all the early rabbis always spoke about Israel. Israel was always something that is part of our hopes, part of our aspirations. We pray for it in all our prayers 365 days a year. We have prominent uh, historical figures like Rabbi Yehuda HaLevi or Ramban and many Middle e medieval Sephardic personalities that spoke of early tradition of Aliyah. And that's really not our concern because we see that among Sephardim, among Ashkenazim, there was no real difference. Everybody believed in that. It's what happened later on and how did it happen later on. So I would like to first look at the expulsion of Spain in 1492, the expulsion from Portugal, 1497, Naples, 1510, and a host of other small expulsions. This basically solidified in the mind, in the heart of the Sephardic Jew that they weren't safe. They weren't safe any place that they went and we had to return home. And you had the Conversos and the Muranos and the Tanusim who felt it more than anyone else because they were living a dual life they were hiding and they had to find a way to reconnect and come home. And there were a number of them that were able to escape into the Ottoman Empire. And once there under the rule of the Sultan, they felt safe to come out. And they saw that land of Israel was in Ottoman hands under Ottoman rule. And a couple of people decided to make a difference. Specifically, there was Joseph Nasi and his aunt, Donna Gracia. They lived approximately 1510 to 1580, we're talking about. And they had a lot of wealth, they had a lot of power, they had a lot of influence. And they approached the Ottoman Sultan with their idea of building a area for Jewish people in the land of Israel, specifically around the area of Tiberias. And he loved the idea. The Ottoman Sultan thought this was a fantastic idea because they were coming to him with money, of course. But they didn't just come to him with money. They had a plan, a well thought out plan, and it was focused on incentivizing silk and wool production. And that would bring a lot of money to the land. And they started doing it. But unfortunately, once they died out, they 
passed away, they weren't able to, you know, the people, they didn't have their idea established well enough among their supporters for it to continue and unfortunately it died out. But they already brought people to Israel in that early, early wave. And there was a great settlement of Jews in the city of Safed. And that of course was the seat of Halakha and Kabbalah. Halakha being what we called Shohan Aruch and Rabbi Yosef Karo. And Kabbalah will talk about the Ari, the Rabbi Yishak Luria Ashkenazi. And those were the main seats of Halakha and Kabbalah. And from there that disseminated throughout the world. Now, was this confined to just the Middle East? And it wasn't really. The Seferidim in the Western world were also very, very much involved. Um, there was a gentleman here in the United States, and in fact, he was considered the most influential Jew in the United States in his time. His name was Mordechai Manuel Noah. He lived from 1785 to 1851. And he was an accomplished Sephardic American politician, playwright, editor, and he even served as American consul to Tunis. And through his interaction and his experiences with the Jews of North Africa, he came to the conclusion that Jews must reestablish their homeland in the land of Israel. By 1825, he purchased land on the Niagara River for a proposed Jewish colony. This was his experiment. And he called this Jewish colony Ararat, which he envisioned as a waypoint and training ground for an eventual Jewish territorial restoration in Zion. So he wanted to see, can we actually take hold of Israel and develop it? So let's try here in the United States. And if my experiment works out, then we could pick up and we could move to Israel and we could do it over there. And he called this city Ararat a city of refuge for the Jews. And he elicited much discussion regarding a Jewish territorial restoration. And he, lot, he had a lot of support from numerous Christian and Protestant ministers, as well as many members of the US government. His plan was industrious, capitalistic, incremental. He envisioned an agricultural base, which would be aided by a merchant class who would utilize technology such as steam to spur economic growth through the trade. Unfortunately, like those before him, he passed away before he had a chance to envision it going further than his little piece of land in the Niagara Valley. But there were others. He wasn't the only one. The famous English writer, who I'll speak about now as well as later on, Grace Aguilar, she was a very, very special female. And she shared her important nationalistic perspective with thousands of Jewish and mostly female readers. Most striking was her insistence on increasing Hebrew literacy. From 1842, she wrote, it is absolutely necessary that Hebrew should be part of the education we bestow our children. I remember this is decades before Ben Yehuda, decades before, and she really pushed it. And we'll talk about it when I speak more about language. She said basically that language would promote political unity among the Jews. It doesn't make a difference where the Jew is. As long as they're all sharing the same language, that will promote political unity. Also in the United States, we had Judah Turo, 1775 to 1854. And as we know, his name is famous. He was success, a very successful American Sephardic businessman who left his fortune under the custodianship of none other than Sir Moses Montefiore. And it was left in Montefiore's custodianship specifically to be invested in the Holy Land. Montefiore used his own funds as well as the funds of Turo and other Sephardim to build areas, the first settlements outside of the old city of Jerusalem new neighborhoods like Mishkenot Sha'ananim, Yemin Moshe, and others. And these were an important catalyst to the growth and resettlement of modern Jerusalem. Um, Sir Moses Montefiore is well known, maybe possibly even 
we wouldn't be wrong to call him the most important Jew in the 19th century. We know that he had so many charitable endeavors, but other than that, he was well known for not just being a philanthropist, but for going, traveling the world to help his fellow Jew, no matter where they were. He went out on humanitarian missions and it was not easy to do at that time. He himself personally made the dangerous trek to Israel seven times. Imagine traveling to Israel seven times between the years of 1827 and 1875. One time would have been difficult, seven times impossible. And he, he had a mission to build new neighborhoods. He conducted a census, he invested in the local economy. Years later, the famous Rabbi de Sola Pool, the rabbi of the famous Spanish and Portuguese synagogue in Manhattan, Sherid Israel, he recognized Montefiore as someone who opened the gates of hope for the Jewish Renaissance in the land of Israel. That's from one of Dr. Poole's early speeches regarding Israel. A contemporary of Montefiore expressed many years before the Dreyfus affair, Montefiore's concern for an answer to the Jewish question. He said, I do not expect that all Israelites will quit their abodes in these territories in which they feel happy, even as there are Englishmen in Hungary, Germany, America, or Japan. But Palestine must belong to the Jews and Jerusalem is destined to become the seat of a Jewish empire. Basically, he really foreshadowed much of what Herzl said and did. But people don't think about it. People don't even remember him for it. They just think of Montefiore, charity, Damascus affair, we're done. They don't go further than that. They don't see his important role in the establishing of the Jewish seat in Palestine. As the continental Jewish community pondered the challenges of emancipation in Central Europe, the Sephardi diaspora in the Middle East was laying a foundation on which Herzl and the other Zionists would soon build upon. But where did this really come from? And this is where we get to the point of Sephardic modern Zionism, as I like to call it. The most important figure in those early days was Rabbi Yehuda Bibas. He's virtually unknown. He lived from 1789 to 1852. He lived in so many different areas. He was born in Tetuan, which is in northern Spanish Morocco. From there, he moved to Gibraltar, from there to London, from there to Corfu, from there to Serbia, and then finally settling in Hebron. And Rabbi Yehuda Bibas did not leave us any of his writings. We only know about him and what he said from people who actually heard him and wrote down for us and told us what he said. And in 1840, this, this is 1839, 1840. These are three very important points that we have from him. First, the Pasuk in Malachi. And this pasuk is a well-known pasuk. It says, Shubu elai ve'ashuba alechim. Return to me and I will return to you. So this is a pasuk about making teshuba, about making repentance. What does Rabbi Bibas tell us? Real teshuba means returning, returning all of you where? To my land, the land I promised you. When you return to my land, that's when I will return to the land and the Shekhinah will return to the land because that's what this, this teshuvah is. Doing this teshuvah is what I refer to in Malachi. Then he said, prior to that, he also taught that the Jews are in need of learning all the wisdoms of the world. Humanistic education is of primary importance. A healthy person, if he takes medicine, it will do him harm. But if he is ill, he must stop eating normal food and take the medicine instead. The Torah is our bread. And the Jews have been eating this bread, but now the Jews are sick. The Jews are ignorant. The Jews are degraded. It's time to put aside Torah and learn the humanities, learn the chokhmot, learn the sciences. And not just any science, we need to learn military science because we're gonna have to seize back our ancestral land. He said this in 1839. 
way before anybody else said it. Finally, he said, when the Jews move to Israel, and we must move to Israel, we need to be active members of society. We cannot be like the Jews that are presently in Israel, just out there collecting alms, collecting charity. That's not the way for a Jew to live. Rabbi Yehuda Bibas had a student. This student, Rabbi Yehuda al Kelai. Rabbi Yehuda al Kelai was in Sarajevo and he wrote extensively about Zionism, about moving to Israel, about getting the nation to realize the importance of leaving our homes outside of Israel and moving there. And he eventually moved to Jerusalem. And he developed the ideas of Rabbi Bibas. And he had a number of very important points. Um, organization to promote international recognition of the Jewish right for Israel. We have to create a Jewish parliament, a Jewish army, Hebrew language schools, Jewish settlements in Israel, and agricultural centers. All these things together will make a healthy Jewish nation in a Jewish land. From there we move on to Rabbi Yisrael Moshe Hazan. Rabbi Yisrael Moshe Hazan came from a long, very well noted and famous family of great Sephardic Hachamim, including many chief rabbis within the Ottoman Empire, within the land of Eretz Israel, and he himself was a rabbi in numerous locales, including Rome, Corfu, Alexandria. And in 1858, 39 years before the first Zionist Congress, 39 years before, he pleaded with European Jewry to establish a Keren Kayimit, to purchase property in the Holy Land. He knew what the answer was, and he knew we had to do it, we had to do it right. So all these rabbis saw the writing on the wall, and they developed plans, and they knew how to go about it, and they started laying the groundwork for it. After him, we had Joseph Marco Baruch from Istanbul. From Istanbul, he moved to Bulgaria. From Bulgaria, he moved to Florence, Italy. And he is the first to start Zionist clubs, and he started them every place he went. And he said also, and he taught all the people in these Zionist clubs, we have to conquest the land. The Ottomans aren't going to hand it to us. We know the Ottomans. We know their mentality. We're part of their society for the last 400 years. We know how to win it back because we know how they think. So these are all very, very important things, important individuals, people that unfortunately have been forgotten for whatever strange reason. It didn't end with them. Oh, another fact that I forgot to mention about uh, Rabbi Alkali and Rabbi Alkali's connection to Herzl. So Herzl learned a lot of what he knew and a lot of his Zionist ideas from Rabbi Alkali. Rabbi Alkali's father and grandfather were Hazanim and Shofar blowers in Rabbi Alkali's synagogue in Sarajevo. They heard the ideas over there and passed them on to uh, Herzl himself. So that's something to keep in mind. Once again, part of the Sephardic connection that nobody mentions. Uh, an interesting rabbi, Rabbi Eliyahu Shammah and Levi, who passed away in Aleppo, Syria in 1814, took a statement from Pirkei Avot, which many of us are familiar with. So Hillel asked these three questions. If I am not for me, who will be? And if I am for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? And he answered them, in relationship to the land of Israel. And he said, the intention of this statement is, if I am not active on my own behalf while I'm still living to ascend to the mountain of God, to the Holy Land, and to die and be buried there, who will? 
Who will take care to ascend me to the land of Israel after I die? What am I compared to God? In the way in which scripture says of God, oh, how abundant is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast brought for them that take their refuge in thee, and the sight of the sons of men. And since the act of Aliyah is incumbent upon me to do, if not now when, because of the authority of death in which one can then no longer act since no man knows when his time to die will be. So Rabbi Eliel Shammah Levi took the opportunity of elucidating the famous Talmudic formulation of Hillel to inspire the reader of the value of making Aliyah to Eretz Israel. This is a type of articulation which is not hard to see, a strong sentiment for return to the Holy Land which paved the way for Zionism among his cultural setting. This is something that we see. Every country that we turn to, every person we turn to, the rabbinic leaders, they all talked about the same thing. So the difference here is that among Sepharadim, Zionism and the push for Aliyah and the push for building the land basically came from the rabbis, whereas in the Ashkenazic lands, it seems to be those that were against the rabbis and those who wanted to make a secular utopian society as opposed to a society of biblical return of a biblical land of Israel of the true Shiva Zion of returning to Zion. Now, as I said, there were so many different connections and there were discussions at times between Sefer Adim and Ashkenazim, what to do and what not to do. Um, I mentioned before Rabbi Yisrael Moshe Hazan, one of his uncles, Rabbi Hayim David Hazan, who was the Rishon Sion, he published in 1863 an open letter to the Zionist Rabbi Tzvi Hirsch Pelisher. And this, if you open up the Hamagid Journal of 1863, it's there to read. And it says, Kalisher had a proto-Zionistic view, which made him an outlier among the European peers. And we find a very different reaction among the Sephardic rabbis. In his letter, Rabbi Hazan claims that all the Sephardic rabbis, all, it is apparent to me are in support of Rabbi Kalisher's ideas, except for some individuals from among the Ashkenazim, lovers of idleness who attempt to uproot the planted. And this idleness that Rabbi Hazan is talking about are those, we'll call them the, what we know today as the Faradim, who want to just sit back and wait for the Mashiach to come, who don't want to be involved. And he's saying, we have to be involved. We have to take an active role in reclaiming our land. And this is something that Rabbi Hazan believed in, Rabbi Kalisher believed in, and something that all Sepharadim believed in, but unfortunately not all Ashkenazim. So Sepharadim, once again, were involved and they played a role. All these rabbis that I spoke about, all made it their business, not only to speak about Eretz Israel, even though they lived outside Eretz Israel, they eventually were able to make Aliyah and they all got there as they wished, as, as they taught. Now, let's talk about Hebrew language, because as I mentioned before, Grace Aguilar spoke about Hebrew language, but without the Hebrew language, we have nothing. And we have, once again, the myth. Eliezer ben Yehuda. Eliezer ben Yehuda is the father of modern Hebrew. Without him, we wouldn't have a language. We wouldn't have speak people that spoke a modern language. We wouldn't have a dictionary. We wouldn't have anything. The first dictionaries that we had as kids I'm sure many of you remember the Hebrew English dictionary, yellow and blue, you know, and said Ben Yehuda dictionary on it. Um, ben Yehuda was born in Vilna in 1858. He made Aliyah in 1881, passed away in Jerusalem, 1922. So let's go back to Grace Aguilar. Grace Aguilar, born in 1816, passed away in 1847. Very short life, just 31 years old. She wrote a book called The Spirit of Judaism, which was published in 1842. Four important points over there. Number one, may we be permitted to hint 
on the importance of making the Hebrew language familiar to any Hebrew child. Two, it cannot be a dead language for the nation it belonged to exists and will continue to exist forever. As such, we must have a living language. Three, the language will link the sons of Israel wherever they may be. And four, we must change the way we teach Hebrew. So Hebrew cannot just be something that we read a pasuk and we translate it, or we think we have an understanding of it. We really need to know Hebrew. Keep that on the side for the moment. Back to Rabbi Yisrael Moshe Hazan. He actually has a book in English that was published in 1845 called uh, Peace, yeah, Peace and Truth, Shalom Ve'emet. And he appealed to the Jews that we cannot neglect our language. We must make it relevant and put it into regular use. In other words, let's speak Hebrew regularly like we see people doing today now. Back to Rabbi al Um He published a pamphlet urging the adoption of Hebrew language as a means of fostering national unity among the Jews. After that, we had a number of very, very important people, writers, editors, publishers, playwrights, namely the main three, and Professor Haramadi wrote about them in a full-length book and their important contribution to the Hebrew language. He had Yosef Levi and Baruch Mitrani, both from Edirne, Turkey. They lived from 1827 to 1917 and 1847 to 1919, respectively. And finally, Nesim Bechar, who was also a rabbi and director of the Allianz School in Jerusalem. Uh, 1848 to 1931. And in fact, he is the first person that hired Ben Yehuda, and he taught him the method that they were already using in the Alian schools, as well as the other modern schools in Jerusalem, and taught him that method to put it into use. So the method that we know from, you know, from our teachings, that Ben Yehuda was the father of modern Hebrew, is unfortunately false. And this was a method that was being used in Jerusalem already. There's a very, very interesting quote, as I mentioned before, um, my friend, Dr. Murray Mizrahi. And I can find this quote, unfortunately. I don't know if I have it here in front of me. But basically, there was a British consulate living in Jerusalem in 1840, and he basically said that all the Jews here speak Hebrew. It doesn't make a difference where the, each Jew came from, whether he's from the Middle East or from Europe or from Asia. The only way for them to communicate with one another is Hebrew, and they're all speaking Hebrew. It's a living language. It never died. It's alive and well over here. So there's no way that Ben Yehuda would have had such an impact to create, you know, a living language in Israel if it wasn't already going on for a couple of hundred years easily. So this is the place of Sepharadim as far as Zionism to move to Israel, Zionism as far as a living language. We spoke about Rabbi Bibas, and Rabbi al Kilai and others who said that we need to find a way to create the army. Earlier on in Bulgaria, Rabbi Eliezer Papo, um, approximately 1800, he wrote this in his Pele Yoritz, very, very famous book of Musar. And he says, there are people that seem in insignificant but they are involved in saving Jewish lives. These are people that put their lives on the line and they fight for other Jews. This causes these Jews to be considered as heavyweights and great Sadiqim. And these Sadiqim surpass even the greatest of our Hachamim, of our rabbis. Rabbi Yaakov Moshe Toledano, 
Rabbi Toledano was born in Tiberias in 1880, um, lived in numerous places in Israel and in North Africa and in Egypt, returning to Jerusalem, or ra rather returning to Israel, he became rabbi in Haifa, then he became a uh, minister of religious education, passed away in Jerusalem in 1960. In 1932, in his book of responsa called Yam HaGadol, he wrote a responsa regarding the buying of ammunition and training people in military action. And he wrote the importance of it, not just the importance of it, but how it's incumbent upon the Jewish people to do this. And this goes hand in hand with our teachings from the Torah, the Nebi'im, the Ketuvim, and all the writings of our Hachamim throughout the generations. Um, love for Israel. You think rabbis, you think old school rabbis, where they're gonna live? They're gonna live in Jerusalem, especially when the country is still new, there's not much going on. Let's take an example. There was a rabbi by the name of Rabbi David ben Shimon. Rabbi David ben Shimon from Rabat, Morocco, made Aliyah with his followers in the 1860s, developed a very, very strong core of a Moroccan community in Jerusalem, which flourished and grew until 1948, when, you know, as we know, things changed. His son, or one of his sons rather, Rabbi Rafael Haron ben Shimon, was called to be the chief rabbi in Cairo, which he served from 1891 to 1921. At that point, he decided to retire. I want to move back to Israel. I want to go back to my ancestral home. And that's why I want to live out the rest of my life. Everybody expected him to move to the home that he had in Jerusalem, in the old city. He didn't. He said, no, no, I'm going to Israel. I'm moving to Tel Aviv. What was Tel Aviv in 1921? It was a small little city struggling, you know, to develop itself as a religious area, if at all. He said, that's where we have to be. We can't just stay in the old. We have to help develop the land. If people want to build up the land by creating new cities, we as the Hathamim, we as the leaders of Am Yisrael, we have to be there as well. We need to be there. We need to show the support, show the people that it's okay to live outside of Jerusalem. It's okay to live in settlements. It's okay to live in a moshav. It's okay to live in a kibbutz. It's, it's okay to live in any of these places. And not only it's okay, it's a mitzvah and it's an incumbent upon the people to do such a thing. And that's what he did. And he lived out his life until 1928 in Tel Aviv. Um, prophecies, there's no reason to talk about prophecies because it's not part of the Zionist experience. It just tells us, you know, that post the state of Israel, there were those who dreamt of it. And even after the Declaration of Independence, there were still people who were coming up with prophetic ways to show that this is, you know, instituted by scripture. But what about Sephardic views of Israel? And our Hathamim told us that you could only look at the positive. You could never look at the negative as far as Israel is concerned. Um, one particular rabbi, Rabbi Yosef Nesas from Meknes, Morocco, as well as from Tlemcen, Algiers, he, his father was a rabbi by the name of Hayim Nesas, and he encouraged people to make Aliyah. And somebody wrote back to him complaining. Now we're talking about 1879 approximately, complaining about life and the hardships in Israel. And as a elderly rabbi, he had an official, you know, well called attendant who would read his letters to him. And so the rabbi, you know, the rabbi's attendant opened the letter, read it to him, person complaining, how did you send me here to Israel? How did you encourage me to move to Eretz Israel? It's terrible over here, it's hardship. The rabbi immediately commanded his attendant, take that letter, rip it, burn it, and I forbid you for ever uttering a word of this letter to anybody ever again. 
we can never speak ill of Eretz Yisrael. This is the love that the Hachamim had for Israel. Rabbi Obadiah Yosef in 1974 said, after close to 2,000 years of persecution, we've returned home. We've had the War of Independence. We had the Sinai War, we had Six-Day War. We won, all three of them. This is Hazaka. Hashem wants us here. We have to do our utmost. Rabbi David ben Shimon that we spoke about a minute ago, the father of Rabbi Rafael Haruma Shimon said, anybody living in Israel, if he's not thrown out of the land, by the land itself, he is a Sadiq and he's greater than anybody else, any greater than any rabbi living outside of Israel. This was the love. This is the way they saw things. When the state of Israel was declared in 1948, something fantastic happened in Libya. We think Libya, we think Gaddafi. We don't think Jews, we don't think freedom of thought even. And 1948, obviously, it was a different time. The Libyan community, all the rabbis together, made an official proclamation. Listen to this. Listen what they declared. All children born the week of Yom Asma'ut were to be called, if they're a male, Israel, if they're female, Siona. All children born that week had to be called either Israel or Siona. Two, all would celebrate a holiday observance with a festive meal with wine and singing and offering of charity to the poor. All businesses were to close and no supplications in the prayer to be recited. And all were to come in holiday clothing to the synagogue for celebratory prayer. This is a real holiday. This is like a regular holiday, like you would be closed for Pesach or Shavuot or Sukkot. You have to do the same thing now for your Ma'at Plus, you have to name your children with these new names because of the miracle that God granted us. This was the love. This was the caring of Israel. Something, once again, we don't hear about. The Sephardic majority existed in, Is in Israel until the turn of the 20th century. Unfortunately, as we know, most of the early leaders and historians who wrote Israel's story were from the Ashkenazic leadership and paid little attention or were simply unaware of the Sephardic contribution. To make things worse, many elitist Europeans were unaware of and uninterested in the culture of quote-unquote non-Western Jews. I remember as a kid even, in the halls of Flap or Shishiva. You know, many of the Ashkenaz, my friends, you know, or teachers or rabbis, they couldn't accept that Sephardic people came from places of education, of influence, of culture, you know, but I don't get it. The, those who came with the first and second Aliyah, third Aliyah, they came from rural Russia, Eastern Europe. Where did they come from? Did they come from anything? My family came from cities like Cairo and Alexandria. You know, my wife's family from Baghdad, friends of mine from Istanbul. These are all great metropolitan cities of wealth and culture. There was opera, ballet, theater in these cities already going back from pre-1900. So us Sephardim or Mizrahim as we're called in Israel today, we've been exposed to Western culture and the ideas that came from countries that were once subject to British or French rule. And the people were literate as well. Many were even highly educated. So many people had degrees in medicine, law, um, architecture, engineering, and for some reason, just brushed aside. You're not part of our culture. You're not part of who we are. Something that I always had a hard time understanding. Um, many wealthy Jews from Iraq couldn't make it. Their government wouldn't let them out, but they were very, very extremely wealthy. They were able to channel their money to build up Israel. Two great examples. Uh, you had Sir Elias Kaduri who passed away in 1922, and he left 150,000 pounds sterling 
to establish two agricultural schools in Mandate Palestine. Um, Yehaskel Gurji Shemtov, also from Iraq, donated 140,000 pounds to the Jewish National Fund. In the United States, okay, we spoke about it earlier, but we have to say it again. There was a very influential rabbi, the predecessor to Dr. David de Solopoul, Dr. Henry Pereira Mendez, passed away in 1937. And he was in charge of organizing the formal Zionist movement in the United States. And this is doc very well documented. And Rabbi Mendes was one of the most accomplished rabbis in the United States. Imagine this, he was the founder of both the Union of Orthodox Jewish Congregations, as well as the Jewish Theological Seminary. So Union of Orthodox and JTS, and all the Zionist uh, organizations and movements in the United States. And Rabbi Mendes maintained a unique version of Zionism, steeped in tradition, which he termed Bible Zionism. He was like the Sephardic thinkers before him. Zionism had to be biblical. Zionism all was related to Shirat Tzion. In the early years of the Sephardic Jews from Turkey that were living in the Lower East Side, and they basically only spoke Ladino, they had a number of Ladino newspapers. One of the most famous among those newspapers was called La America. The editor was Moise Gadol. And he wrote something very interesting in a, regarding a gathering for the fast of Tisha B'Av. And he wrote, today is the ninth of Av. Must our people always suffer? No, the Jews of the 20th century are going to put an end to the exile. The ninth of Av was the day when our fathers were content only with the laments of Echa and the dirges over the great destruction of our glorious past. But we, their children, in this century of civilization are no longer content merely to remember the past, crying and singing dirges, do not help us. Reading our books with black covers will not bring the redemption to us. It is rather by thinking better how we can win our lost kingdom that the redemption will come. Many say that the Messiah is Zionism and Zionism wants to take back Palestine and make it a Jewish center. So this was a very, very strong thought. This was something that was going on among Jews from Sephardic countries, Sephardic cities, Sephardic culture, no matter where they were. And this was going on strong from throughout the 1800s and early 1900s. Um, you had Jews of the empire like David Fresco, who was a editor and activist in Istanbul. He had a different idea though. He was afraid that the utopian, uh, utopian style, rather, of idealism of European uh, ideologues who never set foot in the Middle East would upset the local population. And unfortunately, he was right. We do see that, that the mindset of the European Jew didn't understand the mindset of the Arab. And because of that, there's always been tension. David Florentine, who was a Sephardic journalist from Salonika, also talked about the same thing, how we have to find a way to work together with people that are already living in Israel to make it work together. Uh, the first Bishon Sion after the creation of the state of Israel, Rabbi Uziel, who was probably one of the most important Sephardic rabbis in the last century, if not the most important. And even if you've know, never heard anything about it, if you pick up any of his books, you'll see what kind of thinker he was. It's something that really surpasses the mindset and thinking. He was on the level of Maimonides, basically. And he wrote an entire couple of volumes on called Hegione, the thoughts of Uziel and how we have to approach things and how we have to work hand in hand. A new book just came out about him about two weeks ago and new information, archival information came out where he was in fact the founder, if you will, of the Mizrahi movement. Um, 
he created the idea of the Mizrahi movement, and they basically ignored all the, all the other rabbis in Israel, and even though all the, you know, the lay leaders of the Mizrahi movement in Israel, none of them were Sephardic. You know, they all followed his idea, and he, in fact, traveled to numerous Zionist congresses uh, to lay his ideas and to teach the people. Unfortunately, once he passed away, they, they ignored him and everything he, had, he stood for. But without him, so many ideas would have never happened. So close to one million Jews made Aliyah during the course of the 20th century. And if one takes a closer look at earlier Aliyah waves, some interesting patterns emerge. Sefaradim were less than one-tenth of the world's Jewish population. They disproportionately made Aliyah. The early 20th century preset Aliyah of the Sephardic communities comprised one-sixth of the pre-Jewish population of Palestine. This ratio was much higher than the proportion of the Sephardic Ashkenazic Jews worldwide. And today, as we know, Sephardic Jews are the majority of the Jewish demographic in Israel. Sephardim always looked upon the land of Israel as a fulfillment of a religious aspiration. This is who the Sephardim are. Sephardim were always connected to Israel, always cared about Israel. And in conclusion, you know, what can I tell you? I spoke, to, I spoke about so many different rabbis because they're the ones who really made the difference for us. The Sephardim were involved with, on the Zionist enterprise, not on many levels, on every level. In fact, they were involved in Zionist enterprise before the Zionist enterprise, the way we know it, even existed. While some came to Israel with different motivations, the majority of the Sephardim were motivi motivated by traditional understandings of the biblical prophecies. That's the way the traditional Sephardim till today sees himself and because of that, unfortunately, the traditional Sephardi has never been able to connect with even the, what we'll call the religious Zionist movement of today. And the religious Zionist movement of today rarely, if ever, looks at Sephardim or includes Sephardim. So there has always been this rift, as you will, among Jews in Israel, and even though Sephardim today are the majority, they still don't have the standing that they should have based upon all they did for the state of Israel. And that's basically what I have to say for now. I could keep going on. There's a lot to talk about. I'm just looking at my notes over here, as you could tell, and it just doesn't end, you know. Uh, I'm open if anybody has anything they'd like to ask. That's, of course, with... Uh, Itai's permission, or I don't know how you want to handle this. Please. Yeah, so thank you so much, Joey. Um, I think the, the easiest way to do this, if, you, if people want to use the kind of hand raise uh, um, feature, and then I can unmute people so it doesn't get too much of a balagan. We have some time for a few questions, so I will look for the hand raises. We have Michelle, so I will unmute Michelle. Thank you. Um, I'm blown away. <laughs> I'm glad um, to hear that. I, listen, you know, my husband has worked with Spartim in the, in the, um, from the army, huh? from the army in Israel. He's a Sabra all the way through, all the way through the, uh, the apparel industry where he spent his working years. And I, of course, having taught in the Yeshiva Flatbush and having worked privately with students, but um, this is a whole new chapter. I think what might be good as a follow-up is if you could send um, maybe Itai or Robert O'Kayer a brief bibliography okay, of some, I work key, on that. some key books, not two, 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 you know, for the layman. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we're all educated in Kingsway. And, um, and that would <laughs> give us uh, a chance to continue on the path that you have so... Uh, eloquently and masterfully set us. My pleasure. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. Since you bring that up, it's interesting. There was also another rabbi who I forgot to mention, who I'm a big fan of, Rabbi Mordechai Atiyah, who made Aliyah from Syria to Jerusalem as a child. And 
he unfortunately, due to financial constraints, had to leave. He spent a stint in Mexico City as rabbi. And while he was there, he began writing. And in his lifetime, he wrote a total of seven books. All seven books only about making Aliyah to Israel. Every Jew must make Aliyah. He finally was able to move back um, around 1952. He spent the remainder of his entire life there until 1975. And every one of his books is a gem, all about how we all must move there. And nobody belongs anyplace else but Israel. Next, we've got, thank you, Momea. Hi, Joey. How are you doing? Hello, Good Mo. to see you always. Thank you. Okay, here we go. Um, so I echo the previous speaker as well as uh, for a bibliography uh, for the layman. Um, and secondly, I mean, you packaged this so well, Joey. Write a book. <laughs> Come on. I will try. <laughs> we'll never get this much information in one concise location. It's, uh, it's really um, uh, a pleasure to hear and, uh, you know, always good to see you. Thank and uh, you. that's it. Just leaving, leaving you with that note. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I don't uh, see any other hands. Uh, I'll give it another second. Otherwise... Thank you very much, Joey. We really appreciate it. It was pleasure. extremely informative. Uh, Thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, we look forward to the bibliography. If you get it to us, we'll send it out to our uh, I will definitely our work on it and get it out to you. Absolutely. <laughs> right. it's a great idea. Thank, Thank you, Thank Michelle. you all. Take care. Thank you, Itai. Good night. Good night. Good night.